Thank you very much, and uh, thank you so much for inviting me as well. Now, tonight, I I'd love to say I was talking about planes, trains, and automobiles, to coin a phrase. Now, I'm actually not going to be talking about planes. I'm going to be talking about planes, ships, and automobiles. Uh, and since I think I last uh, came to speak to you 12 years ago, we spent a lot of time doing vanilla research into new areas. And some of those which really surprised me are the security of shipping. It's an area that we are super reliant upon right now with the challenges around the ports, around the coasts of the UK right now with the, uh, the uh, delays there. I think it's even more uh, top of our mind. So I want to talk, start about the security of shipping. And the image I've got up here was actually a bit of a mistake. I, uh, I asked one of my colleagues uh, to do me an image of USB ports on a ship. And he kind of took me at my word. Now, I was expecting him to come up with a picture of an electronic charting system with a USB port in the side. But he went off and put some USB ports on a picture of a ship. And you know what? I quite like it, actually. So I've decided we're going to keep it that way. So I want to talk a bit about the security of vessels, the things that are the cargo that goes around the world. Now, who are we? Those of you who haven't come across us, pen test partners or PTP, just over a hundred of us. Uh, we're big time pen testers, obviously the clues in the name, but remarkably quite a few of the team are ex sham mariners. So we have an ex ship's captain on the team and we have some ex ship's engineers. So those are the guys who be down in the bowels of the ship, making sure that enormous engine works. Um, you'll know that we publish quite a bit of research. If you check our blog out, you'll see there's shipping work, cars and lots of other crazy things. You've probably seen in the press quite a bit of our work on IoT as well. Um, obviously, we've got some accreditations, so Crest for working in banking, um, Assure for working in, in aviation, but lots of others too. But anyway, I'm going to be talking fundamentally about a couple of movie scripts here. It might sound cheesy, but if you go back and look at, I guess, one of my favorite movies of all time, Hackers. Do go back and watch it again if you haven't recently. And uh, now they're probably the worst sequel of all time, Speed 2. Uh, if you go and look at those scripts and the way those movies are put together, fundamentally, they're about people hacking vessels. Now, back in, I think it was 96, 97 when Hackers came out. Yeah, a bit far-fetched. But you know what? It's not anymore. I'm going to show you, too. It happens. This was a yacht called the Lady May. And I believe it was moored up on the Potomac River in uh, near Washington, D.C., and started experiencing some very bizarre outages. A mobile app was causing some problems with some of the systems it was connected to on the vessel. Highly believed that it was a uh, Chinese distant um, and there was some attention coming from Chinese uh, state services. Difficult to prove, difficult to link, but the FBI did publish some information about it, which actually was quite intriguing. Now, before we start, I would say that the industrial control systems you'll find on a super yacht are completely different to those you're going to find on a commercial vessel. So super yachts use uh, an OT network protocol called uh, NMEA or NMEA 2000, which is randomly electrically similar to CAN, so CAN bus from cars. But what I'm spending more time looking at is a different protocol called NMEA 0183, which you'll typically find on commercial vessels, big stuff. Unfortunately, there are a lot of areas that are common, and that's where a lot of the train wrecks of security pop up. The most common area you'll find is in SATCOMs, and that's where the problems started happening. One thing I was quite pleased to see and quite validated a lot of the vanilla research we did was when the US Coast Guard published a safety, a safety alert, essentially validating a lot of the concerns that we'd been expressing for a couple of years, proving that actually they're seeing these things happening in the world right now. There have been some significant areas of progress. So the International Maritime Organization, or IMO, has published uh, some uh, code of conduct, NSC 428, which regulates maritime cyber security. So that's a huge step forward. Unfortunately, shipping as a whole as an industry is quite behind the curve. It's quite common to go onto a vessel and see things you probably last saw on an IT network 10 years ago. The biggest challenge I have within maritime organizations is getting all of them to actually believe it's real. There's a, a huge uh, sense of simply it won't happen to me. It's not going to happen here. And a lot of that is due to ship's captains having a great deal of trust and reliance upon themselves and believing that in the event of an outage, they'll take manual control. 
And as a result, there's been very few ships captains that have really embraced the concept of cybersecurity. But fortunately, that is starting to change. The most common argument we received by Mars is ships captains said, well, why would they attack us? They'll go and hack a bank, right? And yeah, 20 years ago, it might have been easier to steal money from a bank, perhaps. But increasingly, we're starting to see banking, financial services up the game. And we're starting to see commercially motivated hackers start to look for new opportunities, new areas to spend their time. Many of the incidents we've seen in shipping aren't public knowledge. The incidents that have made the press tend not to be those that are targeted. Now, you're probably familiar with the Maersk hack. That wasn't a hack. It was collateral damage on the, the back of the NotPetya ransomware attack. So it wasn't ransomware, it was actually a crypto. Uh, Costco, CMA suffered um, outages. They were collateral damage from potentially nation state attacks. There has been a documented case of an exploration drilling rig um, having its dynamic positioning system disabled. It looks like it was probably on the public internet and a kid was clicking around it and deactivated it. That caused an evacuation of the rig. Most of the incidents you see in the public domain aren't hacks. They're simply collateral damage, someone getting ransomed by accident. They're in the wrong place at the wrong time. The big challenge for us has always been, could we go from the public internet, from our lab, to taking control of a vessel? And I've got a few examples I'm going to talk you through where we did pretty much exactly that. And I'd like to talk you through how we got went about it. Now, the big game changer for maritime security was the advent of uh, always on high speed satellite um, connectivity. Back in the day, satcoms on a vessel was incredibly expensive. You're probably using something like fleet broadband, which cost pounds per megabyte, was incredibly slow. And if there was a sat phone on board, it was probably locked away in the safe. It was so expensive to use. But everything's changed now. All vessels are connected. With the advent of VSAT, we have cheap, always on connectivity. And if you want a good crew, they're going to demand a, a good airtime package so they can do social media and all the other things that you do when you're bored on a ship and you're not actually on the bridge. What we started finding three and a half, four years ago now was VSAT applied to vessels by organizations that didn't really understand security and place those terminals on the public internet. And if you know what to do, go and use your favorite search engine, Shodan. If you know what to search for, you will find satellite terminals on the public internet. Something as simple as Sailor 900, which is one of the most um, popular visa offerings from Cobham. There are plenty of others though. The good news is over time, the numbers of exposed systems have started to reduce, but they are on the public internet. And that's crazy. And given that the installers weren't even thinking about whether the systems were accessible on the internet, we find a lot of cases where the installers didn't even do the most basic things to lock those terminals down. We had a bit of fun. All ships, almost all ships, have to emit what's called AIS. So that is essentially, it's the anti-collision system to vessels. So they all know where each other are and they don't crash into each other. We realized because of the disclosures of GPS data from satellite terminals, we could actually correlate that with AIS. And uh, a couple of years ago, we wrote a ship tracker that could correlate the positions of vulnerable ships in real time. So this is nuts. All open source data. We deliberately delayed the feed of data so you couldn't use it maliciously. But you could literally in real time track where all the vulnerable vessels were. Nuts, right? Why did this happen? Well, we found classic mistakes that we were used to find in the Internet of Things many years ago. So you'd find things like the firmware on the satellite terminal wasn't signed. So you could push back uh, older code, introduce new vulnerabilities. Plain text protocols, yeah, we really are going backwards a long time here. Um, whilst we saw one terminal did have the concept of privilege escalations or privilege separation, sorry, so not everyone was root. Unfortunately, we found as a standard user, we could privilege to root and take control of the, um, of the terminal. That's been fixed on many terminals, but only if you actually update the software. We do found some wonderful um, Easter eggs as well. Chuck Norris kills you in one of the uh, satellite terminals code base, but hey, there you go. There are even proof of concept vulnerabilities. Um, this is an exploit for um, a particular satellite terminal in real time. It's all there. You can download it from GitHub and yeah, it'll give you a compromise on an Intellian uh, satellite terminal. Now, obviously the vulnerability has been disclosed, but it's so rare that organizations update the software on their satellite terminals that you can probably find quite a few out there to exploit right now. Why aren't systems updated? Now we know the core of security on land is to update our systems, right? To fix vulnerabilities. 
Well, a real problem is we found satellite terminal software providers and ground manufacturers don't do a great job of flagging those updates to the operators so they know to do something. This is a genuine change log excerpt from a particular terminal. Then there they're talking about bearing calibration of things and then just hidden away there, general improvements for the admin account security, right? That is actually a complete bypass for the admin login. So you can get straight onto the system. And is it any wonder that organizations don't take these vulnerabilities seriously and patch them? Things are improving. They're certainly a lot better than they were three and a half, four years ago, but there's still a real reluctance to update the systems on board a vessel, particularly when it's not necessarily the owner of the vessel that's responsible for sailing it and responsible for maintaining it. There's often multiple organizations, finance houses, operators looking after a vessel. So often it's not clear who's responsible for keeping things up to date. So anyway, talking about going from the public internet via the satellite terminal, I've now got to take control of the vessel. I'm going to walk you through an example on an exploration drilling rig, uh, one piece of work we did a little while back. Now, these are marvellous vessels. They're half ship, half oil rig. It's essentially a rig that can drive itself around. And a particular organisation came to us and said, we'd like you to see if you could actually do this. Because if our dynamic positioning system that holds us in place in the big seas isn't working properly or goes out, then the umbilical drilling um, line will snap. So that causes huge issues, huge commercial loss, loss of use of the vessel. We're talking millions of dollars of, uh, of, of instance. So they said, right, we'd like to make sure it's safe. So here's a story of how we took control of it. So like many IT networks, it was quite well segregated. So we had the satellites, we had a core network, we had lots of multiple networks underneath. So you had a, an operator, a crew, third parties, a corporate network, a business network, all the way through to the drilling control network. And finally separated out was the propulsion network. And it's this process of compromising the SAT terminal going all the way through that was really interested. Now, when you go on board an oil rig, I have to say that password hygiene isn't great. They clearly spent more time choosing the font to print this uh, default password num sticker on than they did actually choosing the password. So that allowed us to break down some segregation between the business network and the um, one of the drilling networks. This was uh, one of the drilling flight recorders and I do love that password hint. Who do you work for? Well, that was the name of the company we were working for at the time. Now, in, in fairness, it's actually quite problematic because you have itinerant crews. So you come on shift, you work for 12 hours, you go back for 12 hours, you swap over, then you get in a helicopter and you go home. So how do you deal with password management? But I still think it could be better than this, don't you? It took us moments to compromise this. Now, we also find challenges around um, great design, but then the people operating the rig break that design down because something doesn't suit them. And a good example here, do you remember I showed you the picture of the rig? It had great big stanchions down to where the uh, propulsion systems were. Now that was like th I think 13 flights of stairs down a very dark and dingy place to get to administrate some of the, the core systems. And one of the um, engineers, when we went on board, we found a network cable hanging out of one of their offices up top. I had a bit of a look at it and thought, you know what, that network, the shutter on that network port looks quite clean. And there's that fly lead just hanging out. I thought, I wonder what happens if we put it back in. And what we discovered was that um, the operator, to save themselves having to go down 13 flights of stairs to administrate the system and come back up 13 flights of stairs, had actually bridged one of the networks so he could administrate it from his office up on the top deck. That was great breaking down all those nice, safe security measures you've put in place. But we also know something really unusual, corp.local. Now, that tells me this is probably a machine on the business network that's also connected into the OT network, the industrial control network. So, mm, okay, so we started digging a little bit more and discovered that the drilling control network was bridged completely through to the public internet because the uh, engineer had installed TeamViewer on that box. TeamViewer, that well-known source of fantastically secure remote access. Not so good. So we had a complete compromise from the public internet all the way through to the system that was controlling the drill head. Wow. And finally, the route we discovered in many cases, the dynamic positioning system thrusters that move you around will often have remote management as well. So the manufacturer of the, of the engine, 
it's probably got remote diagnostics. A bit like um, jet engine manufacturers will often have remote diagnostics for planes in the air so they can do predictive maintenance and make sure that replacement parts are ahead of you to minimize disruption. Unfortunately, we found the vendor in this particular case had a remote management um, access with default credentials, which we could access from the core network. So we had a route all the way through public internet through not only into the, um, the core network, into the drill control network, and also took control of the thrusters, which moved the vessel around. And if the weather picked up, turn the thrusters off, and you've got a huge problem. Quite worrying, right? We've actually done something very similar on a cruise ship, um, had control of uh, the thrusters on a cruise vessel remotely from our lab through a series of misconfigurations, which is pretty worrying. The slightly scary bit was we also recovered admin hashes from some of the systems on the business network on the vessel and discovered not only could we compromise one rig, we could compromise all the other rigs they owned and HQ and all the other shore-based offices too because of the vulnerabilities on the, on the vessel itself. And this is kind of scary, right? You've gone from the public internet through a rig to the other rigs and then you've to compromise and take domain admin on the shore systems too. And this is often the, the blind spot for many organizations is those shadow IT systems that maybe sit outside of your core expertise in general IT, maybe a production system, maybe a production line, maybe uh, a building management system, something that's perhaps in your blind spot. I think if there's one thing you take from all of this is please go and check those other systems that might be in your blind spot right now. They might not be oil rigs, you know, they might be the gate line or the access control, but they might not be fully covered right now. We also spend a huge amount of time looking at industrial control systems. Uh, as you'll well know from the Stuxnet instance um, many years ago, uh, there are lots of custom systems, so programmable logic controllers that you'll find on these uh, these industrial control systems, whether they're rigs or ships or whatever. Um, these are particularly our custom um, PLCs. They're made by a very big um, maritime technology manufacturer. And we wanted to do some research. We went onto eBay and bought one. Fantastic. And we were blown away. Maritime tech PLC provider. Most times when we look at a PLC, you'll find there's a login and you have to log into it and someone's forgotten to change the password or the password's not very good or you could reset the password somehow. I've never seen a PLC on shore systems that had no authentication at all, literally just connected to it. It was mad. And we reported that to the vendor and said, this is pretty concerning. Um, and the vendor, their response blew my mind. They said, it's a ship, physical security is enough. So, yeah, maybe 10 years ago before we had SATCOMs, not anymore. And this is the huge challenge we have is maritime tech vendors are so far behind the curve of cybersecurity, it's causing problems. Oh yeah, they also told us if we port scanned it, it would void the warranty. And uh, this is not good. You know, vulnerability disclosure is difficult, but this is like a decade behind the curve. There are lots of other crazy things you can do to vessels as well. So it's one thing taking control of the vessel, but it's another thing altogether providing dodgy information to the, sh um, the bridge uh, crew. If you provide the wrong information, they'll make the wrong decisions and do the wrong things. And instead of steering away into safety from another vessel or the shore, they'll steer into another vessel or could potentially cause a collision. Now, that's a picture of a ship's bridge, it's one we've been on. Uh, there are two systems there. The one on the left, that is called the ECDIS, or the Electronic Charting System. And on the right, that's the ARPA, or the Synthetic Radar. Um, believe it or not, those are both Windows boxes. When do you think they were last patched? Most times, you go on board, and you're lucky if you find them on Windows 7. Windows 10 is rare, except for a very recently fit, um, launched or refitted vessel. We're also seeing a lot more technology enter the bridge as well. So you're seeing um, arrays of screens from integrated bridge and control systems. You can have integrated control and management systems from the bridge. Lots of really cool stuff going on there. But of course, maritime tech vendors not doing the best job of doing security well. It's also a real challenge when you've got a ship being refitted with new and old systems being mashed up together. That causes all sorts of problems. This is work, some work we did on a ship's electronic charting system. I would have played this as a video, but it's better as a still, actually. We discovered that the ECDIS system had uh, network interfaces that were unprotected. 
Uh, they had default credentials in, they had exploitable vulnerabilities in, they're using um, all sorts of crazy stuff. And you could inject new data into it. So that is a vessel inside the harbor wall at Dover. And simply by tampering with the way the chart system thought the GPS receiver was in the vessel, you could move the vessel by over 300 meters. So you could drop it either side and make the crew think they were the wrong side uh, of an important breakwater. Now you're thinking, look out the window, right? What if it's foggy? All of a sudden, you have these systems that are critical become really, really important. And yet you can tamper with them in a really straightforward manner. Other areas you can look at, so that mushroom there, that's the GPS receiver. Now, we all know about GPS spoofing, right? We've all heard stories around um, military spoofing around the Black Sea, for example. I'm not talking about that. That's, that's interfering with the satellite signal. What I'm talking about is interfering with the GPS signal when it's on the vessel. It's a simple serial data stream that goes from the receiver into the charting systems. It's unencrypted serial data. Uh, it also conforms to the protocol NMIR 0183, and you can simply get it. There's no validation of the data and just change it. So it's quite easy just to send duff information once you're onto the vessel network already, whether that's remotely via satcoms or you've installed some malware or whatever, and you can start making the crew do weird things. Uh, now, obviously, gross GPS errors will be picked up. But if you introduce them slowly, you can start to cause challenges. Other areas that the commercial hacker will go for, and this is a piece of research we did a couple of years ago, looking at a completely unfamiliar system I've never encountered before. Now, you'll remember about uh, piracy of vessels off the coast of Somalia, for example. A lot of, there were a huge number of issues in the early 2000s around vessels being boarded and taken and hijacked. We're seeing slightly different things happen now. So a pirate will board the vessel and the crew will go into the citadel within inside the um, inside the, the bowels of the ship, a safe area where they can be secure. And then a little bit later, they'll come out and discover that the pirates have gone. But a few containers have been emptied and typically containers with very high value components. And that means you need to understand the loading system of that vessel. Um, that is all generated from a system called Edifact. Uh, Edifact is an unencrypted uh, plain text messaging system that is the heart of containerized transport. It affects lots of other things as well. Um, and that's used to create the um, uh, what's called the bay plan or the BAPLI, which tells the, the loader where to put particular containers on the vessel so they can be offloaded most efficiently in the right order and also critically for balance of the ship. Don't believe me? So there's a really interesting legal case uh, from a theft of some two containers from the port of Antwerp. It made the press, um, well, it made legal press in 2017. Looked like it happened a good few years earlier, but uh, it looks as though someone has intercepted and tampered with this messaging system called Edifact, found the pin release codes that the drivers of trucks need when they drive up to the port. They put a pin in, they get the right container, they go. You've got the pin, you get the container. So truck turns up, the container's not there. It had been stolen by someone else. And there's a very interesting legal case. I'd recommend you have a read of it. It's amazing just how much time and uh, attention hackers spent compromising the, um, the release code system in the port of Antwerp. Uh, something like 50 containers look to have gone missing over a period of time. Uh, Edifact is a fascinating um, environment to play with, but it also does other things. So every shipping container has what's called a verified gross mass or VGM. And that tells the loaders where to put that container in the stack so the ship's balance or metacentric height is correct. If you have the, the um, con heavy containers too high, you get too much rolling motion. If you have them too low, you get some other challenges. And actually, you can start tampering that with that by intercepting these messages and tampering with the data so the container is misloaded. And you could start to cause loading issues and stability problems for certain vessels. You probably remember the Hugasaka in the Solent. Do you remember it uh, was a car carrier um, coming out of the Solent? It had been misloaded, nothing to do with hacking, it had just been misloaded, made its first turn, fell over, unfortunately uh, capsized onto the Bramble Bank, so it didn't turn turtle. But you could do similar things if you were so minded with a vessel. Believe it or not, there's also financial information shared. 
using this system too. And this blows my mind. So an extension of Edifact called IFTFCC contains um, transmitted banking details, which just blows my mind, unencrypted. Anyway, that ships, whistle stop tour. Let's talk about planes. So over the last few years, we've had access to recently retired airframes. It's very difficult to learn about the functioning of planes because you can't hack them because they're flying. It's kind of bad news hacking planes. But one kind of silver lining from um, the downturn, it means that a bunch of planes have been retired into breakers yards. And for a period of time, they're still functional. And we've managed to get access and start understanding how planes work and start understanding some of the security. Uh, what I would say, though, is you need to be really careful with airplanes. Um, I fly a lot, I certainly used to anyway, and our families and friends fly. So what I don't want to do is go out there teaching people to hack planes or crash them. And there's a lot of um, misunderstandings about plane security. People talking about hacking the plane from the passenger seat, doesn't work like that. It does not work like that. I am a pilot. Um, we have a 747 pilot on the team. Uh, it just doesn't work like that. There is, um, there's always a human in the loop. However, obviously humans can be fallible and you can introduce confusion to them. And that, that's my biggest area of concern. We've also seen some very misleading media stories about people hacking planes from the in-flight entertainment system. You can't do that. We've seen some quite sensationalist media coverage, journalists getting very excited and really, I think, destabilizing the industry some. That's not helpful. So we work very closely with the industry. We work through the Automotive ISAC. In fact, I had an email from them not an hour ago about really careful, responsible disclosure so things improve without scaring people off flying. That's not what we're trying to achieve. Anyway, how did we get started? With old planes in breakers yards. And it's great fun playing around in a plane. Let's get in, turn it on, off you go, see what you can do. A little bit of a, a 101. So there's lots of different air, um, interesting areas inside a plane. So you've got ground power, which powers it up. Avionics bays are really interesting. Once you're in there, things are kind of scary. Um, that's the avionics bay of an Airbus A320 we were in. Um, any one of those boxes, they're called line replaceable units. Um, they all use quite um, arcane protocols. Uh, Arink 429, as I recall, which is a really interesting protocol. But most of the networks on these planes aren't really networks in the conventional sense. They're more point-to-point -point wiring. Uh, latent planes, so the 777 had a more of a bus network, uh, you called Arink 629, but the latest move is towards more of an Ethernet based backbone, which is called Arink 664. Uh, that's where things get a bit more interesting from the perspective of more accessible network protocols, but also because cybersecurity is better understood in those places, it's actually easier to lock them down too, so bring it on. There's quite a lot of connectivity on a plane, so you're probably familiar with um, VHF, which is your radio. Um, you can listen in that. Uh, there's lots of interesting um, technologies and lots of interesting data that stream to the plane. So in the past, you would use, um, oh, I can't remember, got out of my mind, um, flight briefings and flight plans were communicated over radio data to the plane. Uh, but the pilot would, of course, have to accept that. We have one of those devices in the office. The only button that's worn out is the accept button. Why would a pilot question it? If you could send modified data to the plane, the pilot would accept a bizarre route plan and potentially take them a while to figure out what's going on. Uh, that's one of the uh, uh, cockpit display units we were working on. Uh, again, you can input data to it, but of course you're behind the physical security layer of the cockpit wall as well. The good news is, is planes are segregated and isolated. So the bit that we fly in, so the, uh, the passenger domain, that's the PISD, so that's the in-flight entertainment system. No connectivity through to the aircraft control domain. That's the bit that makes the services move and go up and downy stuff. Uh, there is a space between that called the information services domain, and that's the bits you'll see, for example, cabin crew working on. You might see them working on the screen on the wall, doing various communications. And in some larger planes, you'll see terminals that the crew can use as well. Now, this is going to take a while to load. It's a video we made looking at the anti-collision system inside planes. It's called TCAS, or the uh, Collision Avoidance System. And it's, um, it essentially works by two planes talking to each other. And if there's any risk of a collision, the planes will negotiate, go, right, you go up, I'll go down. It's called TCAS. Um, it's very, very effective. If you, the pilot obeys the TCAS command, there'll be no crash. Unfortunately, um, there have been some incidents where pilots didn't obey the instruction and actually crashed into each other. Um, in a couple, uh, I think a couple of crashes over Europe and also some in the States. Uh, 
This is our simulator. It's an Airbus A320 simulator with full hardware. Um, I'm going to play you a little video which shows it's a really interesting feature of some of the later Airbus A320s. If they can actually fly the resolution advisory, so the avoiding of the other plane um, themselves, we showed you could actually spoof some of that. Let's see if it plays. It was a bit bitty when we played earlier. Hopefully you can see that. So what we've got going on here is the radar saying, hey, I'm about to crash into another plane. So it alerts the pilot. The pilot doesn't do anything, so the autopilot takes over and deliberately descends, pulls back the throttles in order to avoid the incoming plane. If we wait a moment, you'll see in the simulator, wait for it, the conflicted traffic is the red dot on the, um, the secondary flight display. Wait for it. I can see the conflicting traffic fly over any moment now. There, do you see it? So the plane has automatically avoided. Now, one of the challenges um, and pieces of research we did is we realized you could actually broadcast the um, signals that would cause the plane to move potentially from the ground. And there's been a lot of work done in the industry to actually look at stopping these um, sort of hacks. Uh, we were really pleased to see that some of the commercial flight training schools have now started to do training so pilots are more aware of interception with some of these this, some of this road data. The bit that worries me about planes is as we get more connected. So we've got SATCOM on planes. Now, virtually all planes have satellite um, connectivity now. Some of those offer it to the passengers. There's good segregation between those two. There's also lots of other interesting areas. So um, wireless quick access recorders that actuate when you come to the ground. Uh, you'll also find um, uh, ADSB and lots of other information being supplied into the plane. And any of those that you can interfere with, there's potential to start to confuse pilots. And a couple of areas we've been looking at recently, we're about to uh, write some blogs in. Now, this is actually a cockpit of an Airbus A350. Uh, really interesting plane, one of the most electronically advanced planes there is in the skies. It's even got a heads-up display for the pilots, which is amazing. And it, it really helps reduce the workload on the pilots and provides much better information to them. However, those two areas I've highlighted are what's called an electronic flight bag. Now, an EFB is, uh, can be a tablet, and if you've flown on some airlines, you'll probably see a pilot with a tablet. Others, it's fully embedded into the display. Now, in order to save fuel, so to be more environmentally sensitive, and in order to reduce the wear on the engine so you can save money and pass on the cost savings to passengers, it's actually very unusual to use full power on a plane at takeoff. If there's enough runway, why would you cane the engines and burn a load of fuel by going, using full power? So you do what's called an engine performance calculation or a D-rate or a, a flex temperature calculation, and you decide how much power you actually need. And you might only need two thirds of the engine power to get you safely off and up, saving loads of money. Now, those performance calculations are typically carried out on your electronic flight bag, which is, remember, either a tablet or something that's a bit more built in. So we've been looking over the last few months at the uh, security of various electronic flight bags, and we'll be publishing that work over coming months. Um, fortunately, the majority of EFBs are really robust and really secure. Not always used perhaps as, as safely as they could be, but there is it is generally good news. Um, that said, there are opportunities to maybe introduce some um, uh, wobble factors that might cause pilots to maybe input the wrong thrust calculations. Now, any good pilot will recognize they've got the wrong thrust as they're piling off down the runway and simply increase the power. But if you want to go and read up on it, go and um, go and read off, uh, go and read up on some of the instant reports. All sorts of airlines have occasional issues where pilots miskey the data and don't put enough power on and find themselves approaching the end of the runway rather fast, they end up having to fire all the throttles to get themselves off. Um, often through confusion, distraction, or misunderstandings. Uh, fortunately, it's very, very rare that happens. But again, what we don't want to introduce is potentials for introducing more challenges and um, struggles for pilots. Um, we've also spent quite a bit of time working on some very old in-flight entertainment systems. Um, that one with giggles, that's Windows NT4. And that's from a recently retired plane. Now, before I go any further, just because it's NT4 on a plane does not mean you can hack a plane, right? There is no connection from the in-flight entertainment system through to the control system of the plane. Although I suppose you might be able to pop up some dodgy video on the in-flight entertainment system, but even this one's not in use anymore. But it does make it entertaining when you get on a plane and realize that none of your hacking tools work anymore because you've forgotten how to hack into NT4. Now, the last bit of my talk 
is a little bit about automotive. Uh, we spend an enormous amount of time. I, I could speak for hours about auto uh, security. Um, the reason I've chosen this car is it's an Audi e-tron, and I've got one. Uh, I'm a big EV fan. I love my electric vehicles. And uh, it was one of the very first cars in the market to introduce the concept of functions on demand. And it's the idea that you can upgrade your car for the weekend. So let's say you wanted launch control for the weekend. You can pay a little bit of money. You can upgrade it. And fantastic. But you look at the complexity of the systems that are required to do that. So you're going to need, first of all, a telematic service platform. So something in the cloud to allow connection from the manufacturer into the cloud and then to talk into your vehicle. You need an API, so your mobile app, so you can buy the service from via your mobile app. You need a web app so you can register your vehicle. You need a cloud infrastructure. You need a payment gateway. There's all this complexity. You need a, a telematics connectivity on the vehicle, so a TCU. You need a SIM card in there. And all of this adds wonderful complexity that makes things really quite interesting. We found vulnerabilities in telematics platforms. So the TCU in the vehicle, we found um, vulnerabilities in the, uh, excuse me, the these private cellular networks. Do you remember the Jeep hack donkeys years ago? Charlie Miller, Chris Valasek. They took advantage of a lack of client segregation on the Sprint cellular network, which allowed them to access someone uh, a vehicle remotely. We found similar issues on telematics platforms in the past. We've also found vulnerabilities amazingly in the concept of the private APN, cellular APN. We went all the way back to RSC 1994 from 1996, uh, which describes PPP chat, which is the privacy mechanism. And guess what? We discovered the keys that we used to create private APNs were based on, uh, were hashed with MD5. Wow. It's all about turning back the clock here. Anyway, we discovered a lack of segregation on some telematic service platforms, so you could see vehicle A from vehicle B and vice versa. Once you've got that, you've got problems. Fortunately, reported that, all got fixed a couple of years ago, but that's good. We found telematics platforms on the internet by accident. Uh, we found uh, an MQTT endpoint for a particular manufacturer on the public internet. Fortunately, we knew them, we phoned them, they changed it very quickly, and later that day that had been taken off. But if we hadn't found it, what would they have done? We've even, this is mad, so the car is in the hands of the hacker, it's in the hands of you, right? And the telematics uh, control unit, which sits inside your car, it's, it's uh, typically connected to the equal system, so it's a legal requirement in all European vehicles, it's going to have a SIM card in. Now, it might be a physical SIM, it might be an eSIM. Both of those you can pop out or you can solder to work around an eSIM. Once you've got that SIM card, you potentially get a conduit onto the telematics platform. Or you might decide you actually compromise the TCU and use the cellular connection in there. Now, a little while back, we were doing some work and we discovered a uh, we could compromise the telematics um, control unit inside the vehicle. And from there, we could compromise the telematics platform. But we were blown away to discover that the organization we were working for, uh, a large OEM, didn't have segregation between their telematics platform and their corporate network. So we got some domain hashes off the telematics platform and then took domain admin on their corporate network from a telematics unit in the car. That was mad. Again, fixed very quickly, but a very easy mistake to make by failing to correctly segregate and not really thinking that, yeah, my car, I've given it to someone. Potentially that someone could be a hacker. They could be popping out the SIMs or e soldering the eSIMs. I'm using my car as a route into the corporate. That's mind blowing, right? We've also been looking at smart chargers recently. Um, again, a massive EV fan. We found some issues in some cars. smart chargers. We'll publish those soon. Um, <laughs> one that really made me laugh is from all our work in hardware security and IoT, I've never seen a commercial product built on a Raspberry Pi, but this early car charger, one of the very first smart chargers on the market, was controlled using a Pi. And of course, the problem with a Pi you can simply pop the SD card and you've got the entire file system. Now, this vendor actually was very responsible. They responded well to our disclosure and they completely re-architected and the product, product you can buy from them now is really robust. But it was a bit of a shame that they went to market first mover status and built their product on the pie and ended up, you could, you could just do anything to it fundamentally. Other problems we find in automotive, so uh, high-end vehicles, your insurance company might say, well, we need you to fit a, fit a tracker, for example. So if your car's stolen, you get it back. Um, sadly, we discovered a bunch of security flaws in tracker and two other car tracking um, platforms, which meant that you could steal the car, delete the tracking alerts, 
and stop any geofences being busted when your car was pinched and completely defeating the, the concept of the car of the uh, security product. Again, reported to them, the manufacturer fixed it nice and quickly. Um, this one particularly had an insecure direct object reference in one of its API calls and you could hijack someone's count. That was brilliant. Um, we also found some more, some car alarms, which had some pretty scary vulnerabilities as well. And I just love the irony that it's a car alarm or a car security device that you put on your car to make your car safer, but actually it makes it more hackable. And that, that blew my mind. And this one chuckle, made me chuckle. This was uh, like, a, a car, like a car wheel clamp, but instead of clamping your wheel, um, it was called a barnacle and it was clay would clamp on your windscreen in the States. So um, if you hadn't paid your parking ticket, this got stuck on your car, but it was smart. And the idea of being as smart is actually you could, it could be remotely unlocked um, by the parking company and the person who'd been clamped could actually remove it and put it back. Being smart, great, fantastic, reduced cost, made life easier for everyone. So you didn't have to wait for someone to come and unclamp your car. But their Amazon S3 bucket was wide open. So you, anyone could unclamp any car and gather loads of personal data. We disclosed that, they fixed it in the end, thank goodness. Um, but again, this I think really picks up the complexity of cloud infrastructures that a lot of organizations are really struggling with right now. Cloud technologies are moving so quickly, it's getting very hard for organizations and developers to keep up with the security of cloud environments. And it's also kind of awkward because you are, when you're working in a very fast moving cloud environment, you're actually putting a lot of trust in your developers to um, host code, to go serverless, to, to put up containers. You're putting a huge amount of trust in them to do it safely and securely. And we're seeing a lot of security flaws being made as organizations move fast towards the cloud without enough security controls. Ideally, what you do is actually spend time teaching your devs. That's one of the things that we help out with a lot is actually teaching those developers how to do cloud safely so that, yes, fantastic, get your sprint done, publish your code, and actually it's secure by default, rather than publishing it and some researcher, some pesky researcher coming along and telling you you've made a security mistake. It's incredibly complex, very fast moving, but a really interesting area of security. But a lot of it, you can do it yourself. Even something like Microsoft's Azure Security Concert Center, just go through it yourselves. So that when you're bringing in specialists like us, we can tell you about the stuff that the security center doesn't tell you and teach your devs. The good news with all the things I've talked about is there is regulation coming. So in um, Maritime, the IMO has regulated. So in order to get your ship certified and get insurance and pass what's called the ship's classification, you're gonna need to have cybersecurity policies that work. But there's a huge amount of catch up to do. In aviation, there's a lot of work being done in order to make sure aviation is really safe and secure. And the manufacturers are doing a really good job of that. Uh, the problem we have, of course, is legacy, so slightly older airframes. And the same is happening in automotive too. We're seeing regulation become applied. Uh, we're seeing vehicles and connectivity start to be, uh, security start to be mandated. So it is catching up. Like I say, this bit that bothers me is about these connected vehicles that have been on the road for, say, three, four, five years where it takes time to apply the updates. But anyway, that's me. I hope you found it interesting and maybe a bit thought provoking. That's my Twitter handle. I'm on LinkedIn as well. I think Ken Munro and Cyber will get me. But more than anything, do have a good poke around our blog. There is loads and loads of vanilla research on there that I hope you find entertaining, amusing, and also a bit thought provoking too. Anyway, that's me. Thank you for listening. Time for some questions, hopefully. Well, thank you very much, Ken. That was in incredibly insightful, and you've uh, covered an awful lot of content with us uh, this evening. So uh, uh, let let's get started. Um, uh, the first comment that we've had in was from, and please forgive me, uh, Kai Billy E. Garner, um, who was pointing out that um, he was a team member who used to do anti-ship piracy back in 2009. And one of the things he says he noticed back then was the lack of security for systems on NAV and the links, and also new threats from Wi-Fi hacks. Um, given his experience was 12 years ago or so, do you think the situation, if um, Kai, Billy, E. Garner went back on the ship now, has actually improved somewhat? Uh, I'm going to, well, it, it's got better and worse. So the big thing you'll probably have seen is now, since you're on a vessel, um, VSAT's available. So there's good high-speed connectivity um, at sea. 
And that, that is a game changer because now that vessel that was frankly isolated beforehand is now hyper connected. There has been some progress made towards, you know, people are starting to think about passwords and segregation and security, but it's it's so far behind the curve, it's, it's ridiculous. So I actually think you'll find security on vessels probably a little bit worse than where you were back in 2009. Wow. Do you think that's a, a culture because of the general belief that their platforms are so remote from normal IT threats that they just don't need to do it? Or do you think it is cost, technology, technology training? I think it's a cultural issue because typically the vessel was isolated when at sea, but now they've gone from being completely isolated and basically it didn't matter because it was it was a ship, you know, you, you've got to be on the ship to hack it. But it's that instant change from isolated to hyper-connected with VSAT that's just, just caught everyone unawares. And the cultural change that needs to happen both on the bridge and also uh, within the operator on shore is, is so, so significant. I think the maritime sector as a whole is, is struggling to catch up. Okay, uh, Kai's just come back and he's pointing out he's now a PhD student of security uh, on ship attacks mid-ocean, so uh, we're in good company well, tonight. We should swap some notes then. <laughs> absolutely, well, um, please, by all means. Um, Do follow me on Twitter and I'll DM back, yeah, I yep, appreciate absolutely. that. Absolutely. So th throughout your career and just focusing on the, the IoT transport part of it, what, what do you think is the most scary attack, hack, successful or otherwise, that you, you have seen? Um, so the most scary one, the one my jaw hit the floor and I actually got worried was on some med tech about 18 months ago. And I'm not even going to talk about the device because it's just so scary. Um, we're starting to see medical technology become increasingly connected for, for really good reasons, because if you've got good 24-7 you know, analysis and diagnostics of a condition, you can treat it really well. Um, we were looking at one connected device um, which was reporting information and we discovered that you could intercept that data remotely um, and then send bad information back and that was cause medical professionals to make certain diagnoses and that would potentially cause the death of people and we were very lucky and we managed to get hold of the vendor on a Sunday evening within an hour of discovering it. The vendor took it extremely seriously and took action. Um, and we decided in that case, we weren't going to disclose what the product was, what the technology was or who the vendor was, because we didn't want to undermine the, uh, the good things that were going on in that space. That's the only time I've been genuinely scared about securities is in med tech. That is incredibly frightening. Do you think there's sort of a, been a potential risk in some of the early COVID ventilator designs and that sort of thing, or um, have have people like yourself been looking at these? So again, one of the big challenges with medtech is it's very, very difficult to get hold of. Uh, you, the stuff that comes off on eBay is typically 10 years old or more. And actually the medtech manufacturers, because these are accredited and regulated devices, will often, you know, even something like a pacemaker, after it's removed from the patient's chest, there'll be someone there from the vendor to recover it and do analysis on that device. So it's so hard to get hold of the tech for independent research that I think there's a lot to be done in that space. In some respects, though, that's going to impede potential threats as well, although it's no excuse for, for poor technical design. Well, that, that, that you, we've got challenges there because the tech is out there and it's inadvertently on the public internet. Now, obviously we're ethical and responsible. We can't break the Computer Misuse Act, so we can't go poking and probing because you, know, you don't know what's going to happen, but that doesn't affect others who are less ethical and responsible than us. A uh, question from uh, Sam Wattling, who thanks you for the great talk. Uh, he says, talking of electric vehicles, are all car systems equally hackable or are some manufacturers worse than others? Okay, so it's actually quite an interesting um, correlation with with maritime here is by and large the manufacturers are doing a, jo a good job so the big car brands are taking security pretty seriously and, and doing a pretty good job on it where things have kind of gone uh, are catching up is within the supply chain so the manufacturers don't you know, build the electronic components in your car they'll typically outsource that to a tier one two three supply chain and where things kind of are still catching up is actually through that supply chain as the OEMs are now starting to enforce good cybersecurity procurement controls into their supply chain. Um, and so the manufacturers have got the best intentions of, of keeping their, their, their customers safe and secure, but some of their suppliers are still playing catch up. And that's, that's where the problems are. A bit like the maritime tech vendors, they're playing catch up too.
Mm. So in that respect, do you think that efforts like BSI's fairly recent um, BSI Kite to mark for IoT and subsequent standards that they're developing are likely to help in this regard? Um, I have strong opinions about about that, um, which I don't want to share too much. But what I will say is I think um, Kite marks are useful for the average consumer when they're going into an electronics retailer or to, to buy a product and see it's got a kite mark on great i'll buy that one over the one that doesn't and hopefully that's more secure that just doesn't work to my mind in you know complex industrial supply chains and i think the the onus is on the, the manufacturer to enforce their approach of cyber security on their supply chain uh, and i think that's that comes from things like 27001 and and all other good supply chain auditing once BSI sort of padded out into a full spec and it does become an international standard, though, presumably your, your view would soften? Guess what? There's loads of competing standards already. So UL have got a standard, the Internet of Things Security Foundation have got a good standard, GSMA have got a standard, BSI have got a standard. And I think actually what we're going to kind of see is just like this amazing disparate set of standards actually start to come back and be polarised around, around organisations like ENISA, so the European Security Body, and also regulation in the US. So uh, California Senate Bill 327, for example, is a good example. Okay. How do you find the industry when you approach them with identified faults? Is, are they warming welcoming hostile <laughs> is it a mix depending on their their understanding of things so vulnerability disclosure is a huge challenge for me so i i, I look after the vulnerability disclosure for all, all of our all of our research team um so when anyone gets into a bit of a sticky situation where the vendor won't respond that's usually when i'm brought in to try and apply a bit more pressure it's completely variable um Many organizations are super responsible, super reliable, really communicative, and, and are an example, a lighthouse. But then there are others who are a train wreck, um, where people have found things independently and they just don't get it. And actually, there's one going on right now, um, an organization called Nursery Cam. Go and have a little Google. One of my colleagues has found some scary vulnerabilities. And instead of trying to actually just acknowledging it, taking it on and fixing it, and saying, yeah, all right, we screwed up, they're actually being trying to um, undermine him which I find really underhand. That's in incredibly worrying that still in this day and age that that attitude persists. It's a, call the lawyers, we can't have done anything wrong. It's, uh, it's absolutely yeah. terrifying as well. Yeah, you, you can't make every product perfectly secure, but no. you can respond perfectly. No, I mean, yeah. as a, every perfect. software developer here in the audience yeah. will tell you, bugs yeah. bugs get out yeah. even from the best of us. So yeah. and it, bugs are understandable. You just have to take it on the chin and realize that it, that's the nature of the software game, isn't it? It, there's nothing wrong with having a security problem. Yeah, I would ideally you wouldn't, but you know it's more about how you respond. Exactly. And I think your customers will think more of you if you embrace, fix it, communicate, and they're like, Do you know what? Yeah, I'm I'm fine with that. I'd rather deal with a company that had a vulnerability and dealt with it well than one that hadn't had a vulnerability found yet. Indeed, and that attitude also has to apply to ID departments as well, not just the, <laughs> the hardware and software manufacturers, but actually the people that have yeah. to implement it because. Uh, I've been in too many organisations where they've taken the view that, uh, you know, we don't want to hear about this because it makes us look bad. Yeah. Um, you mentioned the three-tier, I think it was, yes, three-tier isolation of networks on planes through the cockpit and then the, the, the air stewardess and then the passenger section. When we fly, we all still have to turn on aeroplane mode on our phones. Is there actually any point in that? <laughs> ah, right. So that, um, to my mind, no. And I think most people forget to turn on aeroplane mode anyway. I mean, um, uh, I've done some wireless network stumbling on board a plane and, and just been blown away to see what's still just flying around on, on, on the plane. What's on the ground still? That said, there have been a few cases where I believe there's been some concern about 5G interfering with the same frequency spectrum that the radar altimeter uses. And the rad out is the thing that, as you're coming in on final approach, will calls out the pilots, you know, 100 feet, 50 feet, 40 feet, 30 feet, retard and, and, and uh, flare. And there has been some suggestion that 5G might interfere with that. But so I think there's a lot of work going on to make sure that isn't the case. Again, doesn't matter in most cases because you're landing visually it just doesn't matter it's those very very rare occasions once a year when the so fog's so bad that actually you're relying on the instruments are you actually aware of any um loss of life incidents or total loss of 
capital equipment incidents as a result of hacking? In the aviation sector, no. And shipping? No. Shipping, hard to say. Um, I've picked up snippets talking to security authorities that suggest that stuff has happened, but it's more commercial theft at the moment. So using the, the protocols to, to steal cargo, so that's, that's much more common and has been proven. That's a, a relief to some extent anyway. Yeah. Um, uh, last question, uh, Kai's come back with, a, with another one. What do you think of the Wi-Fi units like the authors on ships or even cruise ships um, dropping a ransomware attack to the personal personnel using the staff or passengers to get onto the systems on board? Oh, that's nice. I like that, yeah. So have done quite a bit of work on cruise ships. Um, fundamentally a floating hotel bolted to an OT environment. Uh, in most cases, we've seen pretty good isolation, so guest isolation um, on the wireless networks. So yes, you could de-auth, yes, you could convince someone to join your, your, your rogue access point and potentially intercept traffic. But I think those risks are kind of the same you know, versus being on a, sh a hotel on land. It's kind of the same attack principle. You've still got a relatively captive audience, so you can do the same thing. Um, where we've seen things go a little bit wrong are where there isn't good isolation between the guest Wi-Fi and perhaps some of the industrial control systems on the vessel. And we have managed to break down that segregation. So actually your cruise ship guest, your hotel guest, becomes your attack vector. Interesting. Really quick one from Samir Ali here, if you don't mind, uh, Ken. He, he asks, what did you study in university and what did you do straight after university? Any tips? <laughs> so I studied applied physics and electronics at university. Um, I didn't finish my degree. I was kicked out for not doing enough work. <laughs> uh, I then spent quite a bit of time working in uh, hospitality and it was there that I started exploring the vulnerabilities of point of sale systems. Um, that brought my career quite abruptly to an end in, in hospitality uh, and uh, by some fluke, uh, one of the companies that was a, uh, a user of one of the hotels I worked in was Dr. Solomon's, the antivirus vendor. And I stumbled into a job there and the rest is kind of history. Very interesting. Well, uh, we have to leave it there because we are pretty much out of time. But I would like to thank uh, Ken for the insightful talk and his uh, answers to questions this evening. And all that leaves me to do is to tell you about our next event, which is going to be here on YouTube Live on Wednesday, the 10th of March. We are doing a joint event with BCS Advanced Programming and their team. And our speaker will be Mr. Jason McGuinness from Zero Count Limited, who is going to be talking about high frequency trading and low latency trading using C++. So it's going to be a one for the programmers amongst you. And we are going to be looking forward to being joined by the team from BCS Advanced Programming for that event. So don't miss it, 7 p.m. Wednesday, the 10th of March. On behalf of myself, and the committee of BCS Hertfordshire. Thank you for joining us this evening. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe below to the video, and we look forward to seeing you here in the future. Good night.